Sorry for the mouthful, Shelley. Um, I will I will be more cognizant of that next time when uh, providing you with a title, I guess, of the uh, of the talk today, and also some of the credentials that I have. Uh, what a great opportunity to be here with you today. I really appreciate you providing me with this opportunity. Uh, it's a great morning. I woke up. The air was crisp, to say the least, um, which which leads nicely into my talk with the ice and snow coming. And the talk today that I'm, that I'm trying to deliver is going to be on really providing you with strategies that will enable you to live safely in your home and to be able to engage in your community in all the different occupations that you would like to do. Okay, and when we talk about occupations, I'm not talking about paid vocation, so paid employment. These are things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that make life fulfilling. So bear with me as we walk through the, uh, the slideshow. Essentially, I've divided it up so that we will do a, a tour somewhat of my own home and I will point out different strategies that you can use and hopefully, hopefully implement in your own home uh, moving forward. Some of these strategies uh, you will find beneficial, other ones, you know what, may not be for you and that's okay. The point of the talk, again, is to provide you with opportunities, to provide you with possibilities. Not all of the recommendations I am going to provide today are going to be appropriate for you and you need to understand that. You have to think about to yourself what is right for you and what is right for your family. Okay. So an overview of today, I'm going to talk about briefly what an occupational therapist does and what benefit they can be to you. Again, I am an occupational therapist. I've been registered since 2009 and have been working in that profession um, with full, full smiles, full of energy. Um, I'm passionate about it. I teach at the university since 2008 in the School of Occupational Therapy. And I, ca I can't say enough about the profession and some of the, the strategies that they will be able to help you with to, again, enable you to engage in life to the fullest. We're then going to review the common hazards within the home, as I already mentioned, and provide strategies and recommendations to you. These recommendations may simply just be uh, verbal recommendations on things that you can change, so they will be very low cost, whereas other recommendations might be quite costly and involve whole home renovations. So it all depends on wh where your comfort zone is. And finally, at the end of the day, if you take anything away from this presentation, I'm hoping that you will come away empowered. Empowered with knowledge, empowered with the ability to make change within your own lives, so that again, you can continue to engage in those occupations that you find meaningful. So what is the role of the occupational therapist? Well, we work with your, yourself as an individual, we work with families, we work with um, the community to advocate for your rights to be able to engage in occupations that you want to do, when you want to do them, and how you want to do them. Okay, we want you to be able to experience life to the fullest. And we do this in a collaborative effort. So we want you to have a voice at the table. It's not occupational therapy preaching to you, telling you what you need to do. It's working with you to find out what your needs are, what your hopes are, what you're having difficulty with, where are your challenges, and what we can do to come up with strategies to help overcome some of those barriers and help you re-engage in the things that you want to be able to do. So the occupational therapy approach. What is this? Well, we look at the person, we look at the environment, and we also look at the occupation. For today's presentation, predominantly we're going to be looking at the environment and also the occupations. Okay, looking at how we can adapt the environment, maybe that's with making some small changes within and around the home, maybe it's providing assistive technology for you to use, or maybe it's changing the occupations themselves. Even just slight changes might make a big difference in your life to increase your safety and to be able to increase your independence. Again, when we talk about occupations, this isn't just about those paid vocations, as I mentioned before. We can think of them in three broad categories. So we think about them in terms of self-care, leisure, and productivity. So self-care will be the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. This may include being mobile in bed, so being able to turn over and get out of bed in the morning, to go get washed, to take a shower, take a bath, to get dressed in the morning, to prepare your meals. So you may have heard um, in previous spe speakers about activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living. These are the things that I'm talking about now. Okay, so those instrumental activities of daily living are things such as preparing a meal, going grocery shopping, doing the laundry. When we talk about productivity, these are the things that are either paid vocations or volunteer. It's the things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives that make us productive, that, that are meaningful to us. Okay, so it could be for somebody that is still working, uh, again, their paid vocation, or it could be somebody volunteering with the Parkinson Society Southwestern Ontario, or maybe you volunteer with your kid's hockey team or your grandchild's hockey team. It's things that you want to do 
that are, that are productive to you. And then we come to leisure, and these are the fun things, okay? These are the fun, fun activities that we want to do that bring enjoyment to our lives. It could be playing bridge, it could be going golfing, could be canoeing, could be going on, uh, on vacations and traveling the world. It's things that you want to do that bring enjoyment to your life that are more on the lighter and fun side of things. And we take a look at this person, environment, occupation sort of triad, and you can see there where all the circles overlap, we have that red center, that's where health and well-being lie. Okay, this is where we have meaningful occupations that can happen in a safe and productive environment, and that's the, that's the balance that we're trying to achieve. So if we take a look at hazards within the home, so this is my home here. Again, we purchased it around five years ago, and it's been a constant update, as I think everybody can agree. There's always something to do with fixing up your home. Our most recent renovation was our front, front walkway. So when we come up to the front stairs, it was flagstone. And the flagstone over the years, with winter coming and the frost, tends to crack and tends to heave a little bit. And I've tripped on it myself. It was difficult to shovel. It was difficult to clear the ice and snow away. So we thought it was time to, again, make a change. And we put in nice interlocking bricks so it was nice and safe. We can now clear it off and that there won't be any tripping hazards. So what I'm going to do again today is walk you through sort of the home, starting on the outside and go through the home and touch on many of the different rooms and look at different strategies that we can use to overcome some of the hazards that are within the house. I'm going to provide possible solutions, and as I said before, these are just possible solutions. You have to know what works for you. I'm not going to preach to you about getting rid of all your scatter rugs. I don't even want to ask how many of you have scatter rugs in your home right now, because you know you shouldn't. But I'm not going to tell you to get rid of them. That's your choice. It's your home. You're going to live your life the way you're going to want to live your life. Okay? I can just simply make recommendations. It would be safer to get rid of them, or it would be safer to maybe use double-sided tape so that the edges don't curl up or so that they don't slip out from underneath you. Um, but I'm not going to tell you to get rid of them. That's one of my main, my main pet peeves is people telling people what to do. That's not what I'm here to do today. The recommendations, again, some of them are going to be quite easy to implement. They're going to be simple strategies that we can do, and a lot of this stuff is common sense. Okay, I need you to take some time to think and reflect on what I'm saying, and some of the strategies are just simple things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that may make all the difference. And I look around my house on a regular basis, and I have two kids. I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Um, the eight-year-old, I have to struggle to get off the couch. Uh, from playing his iPad, and the six-year-old is like a terror with items around the house. She, I know where she is because I just have to follow the trail of stuff that she leaves. Um, and, and it's dangerous. So my mom comes and visits quite often on the weekends, and I, I wake up early in the morning, and I'm constantly tripping over things that have been left on the floor, or I'm worried about my mom falling and tripping, obviously, as well. So the strategies could be something as simple as picking up items and leaving a nice, clear space on the floor to get around. Again, including adaptive equipment, I'm glad to see that we have a number of vendors in the, uh, in the room today, so feel free during the break to walk around, talk to the vendors, see what services and what adaptive equipment they have available for you. There's lots of great stuff out there. I have a ton of pictures in my presentation to showcase some of the things that I think might you've, that you might find uh, quite useful. And then, as I said, there are some other home modifications, some of which can get quite costly. But if you're going to be moving into a new home or transitioning to a different, uh, different place to live, it's something to keep in mind um, so that you can live in the safest way possible. It could be something as, as simple as, again, putting in a pot filler so that you don't have to carry a big heavy pot of water across the kitchen from the sink. If you have a pot filler already in place, you just put the pot on the stove and then fill it up with water and you alleviate that chance of you falling while carrying a big heavy pot of water. So going into the house, I already talked about our, our walkway, but we also have stairs. Okay, so it's important to keep stairs free of clutter. I know going up in our house, uh, again, my daughter likes to leave stuff on the stairs as a reminder to take it upstairs, but unfortunately that poses uh, quite a large tripping hazard, especially if it's later at night. So we want to make sure that the stairs are always free of clutter. We want to make sure that there's handrails on stairs. We ideally like to see handrails on both sides for you to hold on to. If you have one dominant side that's a little bit stronger, think about using that handrail on the side. So in the hall for uh, today, for example, coming in, it's quite a wide walkway. I would recommend, rather than walking up the center of that, to choose either side and hold on to the rail as you come up the stairs, especially as it is a little bit slippery out there today. Um, talk about using non-slip uh, treads on the stairs. These can be purchased uh, quite readily by a different, like Home Depot, Rona, Lowe's, et cetera. 
and they provide extra traction on the stairs. Some of them are more like a, um, a sandpaper type grit that sticks down on the stairs, or you can get other higher grade ones which are made of metal and a little bit more durable that you don't have to worry necessarily about them flaking off, especially if, if you're shoveling. Um, I mentioned make sure that you have the, uh, a nice lit area. So coming up to your home, again, thinking about including a motion sensor light so that you can see where you're going either early in the morning and as the, uh, the weather changes, it's getting quite, uh, quite dark quite early on in the day. So we want to make sure that we're able to see where we're going. If you have uh, mobility issues and you're looking to gain access into your home, you may consider installing either a ramp or potentially a porch lift. This will depend uh, largely on which one you choose on how large of a, a size of lift that you're going to need. Typically what they say is if it's over two feet, you should consider using a, a porch lift. Okay, so that's the item that's on the bottom where you stand on. It requires electricity, it requires a concrete pad. You would, you would uh, stand on this and it would lift you up to the desired level. If you don't have that great of an increase, you may also consider using a ramp, but there's considerations with the ramp to, uh, to worry about with the weather. So again, you're going to have to shovel off the ramp, going to make sure that it's clear of snow and ice, going to make sure that it's well maintained. If it's wood, the wood could begin to rot, etc. So it depends on if you're staying in your home for a long time. Again, the ramps are much less portable than the chairlifts, where the chairlifts you can move with you, which is quite nice. Going on, once we enter the, stair, uh, enter the home, I've talked about making sure that the stairs are clear. If you have carpet, you want to make sure that the carpet is securely fastened down. Okay, and we do this by either putting rods in there or making sure that there's a good connection with a, with a hammer and a tool to ensure that that carpet is stuck down, that it doesn't crinkle up on you and pose a tripping or a slip hazard. If you do have scatter rugs, make sure that they are taped down or there's an anti-slip mat that you can put like a backing underneath so that the mat doesn't slip out from underneath you or curl up. When walking on stairs, I would highly recommend... Um, Again, you hold the railing, but in order to do that, you need to have a hand available. So if you're coming in from grocery shopping, make sure that you have one hand available. Don't carry two bags in either hand. Or they have some of those uh, reusable boxes, which is a great idea from a recycling standpoint. Again, if you're going to use them, I would suggest you use one with a strap that you can hold in one hand so that you have that one hand free to be able to hold on to the railing at all times. When you enter and you're looking to take on and off your shoes, I would recommend you have a bench available. Okay, sit down. It's much safer to sit down and take off your footwear rather than try and stand and bend over and balance. When we're bending over, you place yourself at risk for a fall. Okay, one of the nice things that I like to use is a handy organizer that just fits in my closet. Alleviates me having to even bend down to pick up my shoes. I can just pop the shoes in. It's at eye level and everything that I need, that includes hats, gloves, car keys, maybe umbrellas. They're all stored nicely in the closet so that they're off the floor and away from a potential trip. Moving into the living room, we don't want you to have your living room organized in such a way that mobility is an issue. So again, we understand that there are certainly tight spaces available, but if you're using a walker, try and make the room positioned such that you can take your walker with you at all times. Make sure that there's enough room in between furniture, in between furniture to get by, use the walker, all too often I see clients who, who tell me that they use the walker at all times and then I go into their home to do a home visit and I watch them and I ask them, okay, let's go in your living room, we're going to have a, have, have a seat. And they take the walker with them, they're very diligent, they put on the brakes and they leave the walker in the corner and then walk from the corner to the couch where they've walked between two pieces of furniture over top of a phone cord, past the cat and then sat down. Um, that's, where, that's where falls happen. Okay, so at all times, we try and get you to use your walker. So again, clear a space so you can take the walker with you back into where you're going to sit down, put the brakes on the walker, put your hand down so you know where you're going to sit, and then have a seat. We don't want you to rush. And quite often, again, falls happen when people rush to either get the telephone or to answer the door. Make people wait. It's okay. We don't want you to fall. The other option is to carry a phone with you at all times. Okay, lots of cordless phones. I just actually had a personal example of this this past week. My mom had a family friend from Toronto visit, um, a husband and wife. They, they came down, the wife took my mom out shopping, and the gentleman went out into the garage for something, and he ended up slipping on one of the stairs, and he was in the garage on the floor for two and a half hours before my mom and friend came, came in. He had no way of calling for help, the garage door was shut, um, and he was unable to get up by himself. So again, if he had a telephone, he at least could have called for help and he wouldn't have had to sit there for two and a half hours. Luckily, he's okay. They ended up getting it up when they came home. 
um, and, and sought appropriate medical attention. A nice thing that you can use is a, which you see on the bottom right, is a cell phone holder. So if m many people have cell phones, you can even use your cordless phones for that. It straps onto your arm, so wherever you go, you have the cell phone, because it's not good enough just to walk and hold the cell phone, because if you think about it, when you're walking down, for example, a set of stairs, and you do slip and fall, up goes your arm, out goes the phone, you're on the floor here, and the phone's across the floor. How are you gonna call for help? So this way, you have it on you at all times, which is safe. Another opportunity that you could have is for answering the door. So again, instead of rushing to answer the door, they do have technology that's wireless now. You can see it in the top right-hand corner that when the doorbell goes, it actually turns on a camera. You can see who's there, and the technology is there that you can speak to them. So say, I'm here, I'm coming, it's just going to take me a minute. Or they also have the technology that you can unlock the door from where you're sitting using a controller. Okay, so you can see who it is. Yep, I'm going to open the door for you, much like you have an apartment buzzer. You can use this for your home environment as well now. We don't want you, as I said before, bending over. So whenever possible, use long-handled reachers, use long-handled dustpans, because again, when you bend over, your balance is lost, you have a larger upper body weight, and it places you at a risk for a fall. In the living room, we want to make sure that the furniture is proper height. Okay, so when sitting, you want to make sure that your hips are always higher than your knees. If your hips are lower than your knees, it's going to be really difficult for you to get out of a chair. Also, if you have older furniture and it starts to sag a little bit, that makes it quite, quite a little bit more difficult to get in and out. Um, so what you could do is either buy new furniture if you like, and you could also put on furniture risers to increase the height. So that's your top right-hand corner. These are, you know, they come in packages of four and they just slide underneath the couch legs to bring that furniture up to a proper height. Or you could use a nice firm cushion to sit on the couch or they have these slats and they're called furniture fix and they go underneath the cushions and if you, again if you have a sagging uh, couch you can put this furniture fix in there's slats of wood or you can use plywood to make it a nice firm surface so that you have something to push up on and that would include also sitting on furniture with uh, with arms as well so something uh, stable for you to push up on to help you get off of the furniture another strategy which i'm sure you've been told before is sort of to scoot yourself to the end of the couch tuck your feet underneath you, and then push up. That increases your ability. It gives you a biomechanical advantage to stand up. Other options that you might want to consider is what's called a super pole, and that's on your bottom left. And this is a pole that is friction fit in, in the, uh, to the floor, to the ceiling, and it provides a nice firm structure to pull up on. They come in different shapes. This one has a swivel arm that you're able to grab onto in different configurations that allows you to have increased independence and to be able to get up independently. Other things are such as a, an electronic chair that, uh, that allows you to, to provide extra stability to stand up. It goes up with you and lifts you up. Or there's items that are, again, non-electronic that just fit underneath the chair itself, which you can see the, uh, the woman standing up. This one actually has a table that swivels in and out of place. So again, you have everything that you need at your fingertips, a phone, uh, medication, et cetera. It's all there for you. And finally, we have the bottom right-hand corner, which is an easy up cushion. And this is a spring activated cushion that again, when you go to stand up, there's a spring inside that helps lift you up to give you that little extra boost to be able to stand up independently. Be caution of scatter mugs, scatter rugs and scatter mats. Um, again, I'm not gonna tell you not to use them, but just be careful if and when you do use them. Make sure that you are using double-sided tape. You can see here in the middle that the edges do tend to curl. That's quite easy to get your foot stuck under there and trip. So just place a double-sided tape under there and stick it to the floor and we won't have that issue. In my house, we do have a back door. I have children. Um, if you have children or grandchildren that play in the backyard, especially with the snowy weather, they come in with all their boots. They tromp snow throughout the house. Make sure that you clean that up right away because, again, we have tile floor and it proves quite, uh, quite slippery and we don't want anybody to slip and fall in the kitchen. I would suggest you take a look at your kitchen and organize it the way you use it. So take all the items that you use on a regular basis and put those in easy distance um, for reaching. Don't have them in cupboards that are too, below, too far below that you're going to have to reach down and potentially risk falling. Or above, the stove for, or above the stove or the fridge where you would need to get a chair or something to stand up on to reach. So if you're an avid baker, for example, uh, you may not want to keep all of your baking sheets above the fridge because you're always going there to get them. Let's keep them at a mid-level so that you can avoid having to stand on a stool to get those on a regular basis. Reachers are great. How many here have a reacher? Show of hands. 
They are fantastic. I have one in around two places in the home. I use them in the garage to grab things when they fall in behind cupboards. And again, it prevents me from having to bend down and pick things up. And the ca word of caution that I would give is that the longer the reacher you have, the harder it is to use, especially if you have heavy items. So if you're in the kitchen and you're looking to get a can of soup down from the cupboard, if you're using a really long reacher arm, it's going to feel like an, amount, an immense weight on the end of that uh, reacher arm, and it may uh, damage your shoulder or it could slip out of your hand. So again, try and use the reacher that is appropriate for the task at hand. If you need a longer one to reach down to the floor, certainly use it. But if you're just going into kitchen cupboards or something that you can get away with a shorter one, that would be the best one to use. They're relatively inexpensive. And you can get reachers that close when you grab the handle, or you can get reachers that are already closed and you have to push on the handle to open up. So again, choose which one works best for you. Don't use a kitchen chair to stand on to reach high places. Okay, this is dangerous. They're too high up and they're dangerous to get on and they're dangerous to get off. It's much better to have a step stool in place and particularly one that has a shelf or a middle arm piece that you can lean on so that it, you, don't, uh, you don't end up falling over the edge, okay? And also ones that have hand railings on either side. Nice, nice and stable. Again, you want a non-slip surface. Moving into the kitchen, we're talking about utensils, and there's a whole host of different utensils that are available for you. Some of these are weighted and have built-up grips to help with tremor. Other ones are such as the, uh, the cup has two hands and it's insulated. Um, two, two, uh, what are they called? Handles, I guess, to, to grab onto. Um, that's insulated and it's also weighted to help with the, the tremor. There's a spoon on the bottom right-hand side. This is new technology. This is called Liftware Steady, and it helps damp out the tremor when you're eating. Okay, it has a, it's, a, it's a rechargeable spoon that has electronics in there that has accelerometers, and it picks up the tremor that you're experiencing, and it dampens or counterbalances that tremor. We also have a, um, a food plate, which is a warming bowl, so there's actually hot water underneath, and while it may take you a little bit longer time to eat, you want to make sure that your soup maintains hot throughout the entire meal. You can use such things as this that will keep your food warm or also use something with what's called a food bumper. So again, to try and prevent having a mess at uh, mealtime with the tremor or with however you're, you're eating if you're have, having dyskinesias, the food bumper allows you to push food up against it and food won't be falling over the side of the plate. Again, other opportunities would be for jar openers. Okay, everybody has issues with opening jars and lids and bottles. There's a whole host of gadgets that are available for you to help you with this in and around the kitchen. We also have a kettle tipper. So again, if tipping a uh, boiling pot of water or a kettle of full of hot water is dangerous, we can put it in the tipper and it's on a rocker arm and all you have to do is tip it forward and hot water will come out. Um, for cooking, again, you have something on the stove that you can maintain your balance. So rather than holding the pot and stirring, you can have your hand on the stove, a nice sturdy spot. That white... Um, metal arm is actually holding the pot in place so that you can then stir the pot while still maintaining a good grasp on the stove and maintaining your balance. Um, bottom left, we also have a finger protector so that if you are cutting, make sure that you're being safe and you don't, uh, don't chop your hands. This is a, a finger guard for that. Dyson is a great, a great product as well. This is a non-slip product that can go underneath your dishes so that they don't uh, slip away from you. If you. Again, if you're stirring a pot, if you're baking, if you're, if whatever you're doing in the kitchen, you need that extra stability to have uh, your hand on the counter rather than holding a given bowl. Um, you can use Dyson. You can also use rocker knives. This allows you to cut food quite a bit uh, easier. You just put the knife down, and then again, it rocks back and forth, and that allows you to cut through food quite easy. We do have an adapted cutting board where, again, the, the product itself is being held. So in this case, it's a cucumber. It's almost in a vice, and then you can cut and have one free hand to maintain your stability. And I've talked about the, uh, the pot filler as an option as well. Something else that you might want to consider doing is placing a tea towel down on the counter if you're trying to move hot things off of the stove. Again, rather than carrying them across the kitchen, put them on a tea towel and slide them across the counter to where you're, you're going. It's just a safer way of doing things. And again, all of these things are very little to no cost to do. If we move into the study or the office, there's built-up pens that, again, are weighted. They're a little bit bigger, a little bit easier to hold on to, and the weight tends to help dampen out some of that tremor if you do have an essential tremor. 
If you're using an office chair, I would suggest you use one without casters. Again, use, use one that's a proper height. So again, remembering you want your hips above your knees and without the casters because ones with casters, when you go to stand up, the chair can scoot out from behind you very easily and you'd be prone to a fall. And you also want to organize all of your computer cords. It doesn't matter how hard I try. I have wireless, uh, I have a wireless printer, I have a couple of other wireless um, gadgets, cords, I don't know where they come from, but they do. They just, they just sort of appear. I have uh, different cords for my cell phones, for connecting to my camera, et cetera, and they are a huge mess, and they are a tripping hazard. So try and use something as simple as one of the, you know, the bottom right-hand side. We have those clips. You can put a clip onto the edge of a desk, and you can feed your uh, cord through that, or you can think about potentially using a power bar, and that's being installed underneath the front of the desk. So nobody sees it, it's where your legs go. The power bar is underneath, all the cords are nicely secured and fastened and out of the way so that you'll avoid, uh, avoid a trip. Moving into the bedroom, looking with assistance for transfers. So again, we have somebody using a super pole and these are floor to ceiling. They can either be mounted right into the floor or again, if you're renting or if you want it to be a little bit more portable, they can be friction fit and they're quite sturdy that you can put a lot of weight on and help to pull yourself out of bed. They're also great for allowing yourself to lower yourself into bed in a controlled manner. You wanna make sure that the bed is the proper height Okay, and again, we don't want the bed to be on casters, and if it is, make sure those casters are locked so that, again, it doesn't push aside uh, when you're trying to stand up. A couple of other devices that you might find useful if you're having issues in, in bed with bed mobility is a ladder, and this is something that attaches to the base of the bed, and it goes across you so that it enables you to literally pull yourself up into an upright position, or we have the middle picture, which is what's called an M-rail, and this is something that fits underneath the mattress, and comes up and again it provides a nice opportunity, a nice secure base to pull up on and help you sort of scooch to the edge of the bed. It allows you to pull up to sit upright in the bed and to provide you greater access for bed mobility. Silk sheets are always an option as well if you're having issues with bed mobility. That decreases the friction and allows you to slide across. I would recommend you not wear silk pajamas and silk sheets at the same time. That may be a little... Uh, you don't want to get too carried away. You may end up on the other side of the bed when you, when you slide in. Um, a blanket support is another opportunity to use if you're, again, having difficulty uh, with your mobility in bed. This is a blanket support that just lifts up the blanket off your feet. And if you have a, I like using a really heavy comforter, especially in the winter months. And it can be quite, uh, quite cumbersome to uh, be mobile in bed with that. So this just lifts this up off of your feet um, and gives you that extra range of motion within bed. Another thing that I've recently implemented in my house for actually my daughter, and I think it's the best thing we've ever used, is a motion light. So we've placed this in our hall, and we want to be able to see where we're going. In this particular one, it turns off by itself in the daytime, and when it gets dusk, it turns on, but it has two settings that when, it's, when somebody walks by it, it turns on really bright and lights up our whole stairway and, and lights up uh, most of our bedroom actually as well. So again, if, if anybody has a master bathroom in their bedroom and you're going to have to get up in the middle of the night to the, use the uh, facilities, uh, make sure that you have a nightlight available so that you can see where you're going. I think all too often we get up and we're sort of still in that, that fog trying to get to the bathroom uh, to not have an accident and that's when you trip over your slippers or you trip over your walk or you trip over something um, that you didn't necessarily see. So a very inexpensive product that anybody can use. For dressing, there's a number of different options out there now, which I think is fantastic. Um, so if anybody likes to wear button-down shirts and have difficulty uh, doing up their buttons, there's a button hook, and that's on that uh, second one from the right. And again, it's just a little gizmo that it's a hook that goes through the hole. You loop it onto the button, and then you pull it right through to do up the button. If you don't like that idea, there's also shirts that have magnets or Velcro on them. And the magnets is called MagnaReady, and it's a product line that all of the shirt buttons are actually magnetized. So it looks like you're wearing a normal um, dress shirt, except they're magnets, and you can just rip them open sort of like Superman, and it makes it that much easier than having to do up all of the, uh, all of the buttons. Again, Velcro, that's something easy that you can do if you're looking for uh, you know, your sleeves. Uh, rather than doing up and uh, taking off the buttons, you can just replace those with Velcro, and quite easy to get on and off. Elastic shoelaces are another great opportunity. Rather than bending down and doing up your shoes, you can just slip on your shoe with a shoehorn. Again, the elastic shoelaces provide that flexibility to give you the room to be able to enter and don and off, doff your shoes with quite ease. And we also have a sock aid. If you have difficulties putting on socks, 
Again, it's this uh, typically a plastic piece of material that you would put your sock over, put it in between your legs, you squeeze a little bit, you feed your sock over top, and you throw it on the floor and you put, uh, you put your foot in, and as you pull up, your sock gets uh, placed on your foot for you, which is quite, uh, quite handy. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, it is now available in Canada. So that's actually your bottom right picture. Um, that is called MagZip. And if you Google that, I believe they do ship to Canada. Um, now, I learned about that actually at a Parkinson's conference that I was giving in Owen Sound. Somebody mentioned that a couple of years ago to me. Um, so yes, I think that's an ingenious product. So again, that's the bottom right-hand picture. And that's where, again, it's magnetic. And the zipper is sort of, la you, you just put it side by side, the magnets attach, and then you can do the zipper up with one hand. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, so yes, I do believe that they are available now in, in Canada. Um, and again, always using a, a dressing stick if you need. So again, rather than bending over to pick something up off of the ground, um, you can just use a dressing stick which has a little hook on it. You can grab your socks, grab your undergarments or whatever to, uh, to put on rather than, rather than bending over. In the bathroom, we want to make sure you're safe. This is where a lot of trips and slips happen and falls happen. Okay? We don't want you to use a towel bar to stand up. I know it's convenient. I know it's right there. And you think, oh, it's fine. I'm just going to you know, pull up on it. But, but they're not meant to be pulled up on. Okay? Sometimes they're only glued uh, very loosely to the drywall that's on there. Or they're not put into studs and they're just on the drywall backing. And then if you pull up on that, it's going to give way. I've seen them ripped, ripped out of walls before with big chunks of drywall being pulled off, and the client ended up falling. And think about what's in the bathroom. You have your counter, which potentially has sharp corners. You have your bathtub, which has hard porcelain tile. Um, a, lot of, a lot of damage can happen to you, and a lot of serious injuries can happen if you are transferring incorrectly in the bathroom. So we want to make sure that you have proper... Um, grab bars mounted. We want to make sure that somebody mounts them who knows what they're doing, so have a professional do that. We want to make sure that they are in studs. If you're in a position where you don't want to use grab bars for whatever reason, maybe you're renting and you're not a, the landlord or you don't feel comfortable putting it in um, to maybe you just got a brand new shower done. This happened to my buddy and he had all brand new marble put in and he just, he refused. He did not want to drill through a hole into his marble. What you can use is suction cups, okay? And uh, they're not they're not the 100% best. I, I would recommend the ones that get actually screwed into the, the, um, the studs, but they do provide a lot of support. And they, they again, as, as you can imagine, there's a picture in the middle. They are suction cupped grab bars that stick on to the shower. Before you use them, I would recommend you always test them, so give them a good pull just to make sure that they are securely fastened. Okay, again, these can be purchased. Um, I know a lot of car companies use them, and some of the, uh, the distributors and vendors are now selling them as well. It gives you an opportunity to, again, take them with you because they are quite portable. So if you are going on vacation, if you are going to visit family and friends and staying for a couple of days, this allows you that opportunity to take them with you uh, to be safe when you're transferring in and out of the, uh, the shower or bathtub. And you also always want to make sure that you have three points of contact. That's the other important thing. Okay, so one foot on the ground, one foot holding a grab bar, and preferably another hand holding onto the grab bar as you step forward into the, into the bathtub. So always try and maintain three points of contact at all times. Another option would be to having a tub transfer bench, and that's what's seen here on the bottom right-hand side. And this is a very secure option. So again, this is a bench that has four legs. Two legs go into the bathtub, two legs go out of the bathtub. And rather than stepping into the bathtub, what you would do is you would sit on the edge of this chair and then swing your legs over into the bathtub and grab onto the, onto the, uh, the railing there and kind of scooch over into the middle. And then you're able to, uh, to take a bath or a shower using a handheld shower wand. Okay, handheld shower wands, if you don't already have one installed, um, you, you can purchase them as prefab kits. They can go on to either the, uh, the bathtub faucet itself, which you see on the top right-hand corner, or they can attach on to the shower head itself with a, with a diverter valve. Um, that would be the, one of the most safest options. Alternatively, if you don't have room for that, because sometimes there are space requirements um, where you have the toilet right next to the, the bathtub and you can't use a shower uh, transfer bench, you would use what's called a, a transfer board. So this doesn't have any legs, this just rests on the lips and they have a mechanism underneath that sort of clamps it to the inside of the tub. Uh, again, this is another good option, not as good as the chair though because it does have four, the chair has, or the tub transfer bench has four legs. This doesn't have any legs 
and it can slip off of the one edge, which is quite, uh, quite narrow. Again, it's a good option, but not the best option. And also we have just a tub mounted grab bar, which again is quite portable. It hangs on the side and gets clamped down onto the side of the bathtub, which again provides you with a nice point of contact to allow you to get in and out of the bathtub safely. If you're looking at actually taking a bath and getting in inside the bathtub on the floor, there are a couple of options. Uh, they do have cushions and chairs that are pneumatic or battery operated that allow you to sink down into the bathtub. Um, I find the cushions that fill up with air, they're a little bit less stable. Uh, so you may want to be aware of that when you're deciding between products. The one on the far left, I really like. It actually has a disc. So what you do is again, much like the transfer bench, you would sit on this disc and then you would push back because it's on a sliding table, and then you would swing your legs in, and this helps with friction. Okay, so we want, uh, we want we, at one point, we want there to be friction because we don't want you slipping in the bathtub, but at the same time, if you're sliding across these benches and they are have high friction coefficient, uh, it would be a little tough on your skin, so this, this prevents that from happening. And finally, we have the walk-in style of bathtub. Again, this is really safe to use. Unfortunately, it does involve you having to get in before the water's in, so it's again, personal preference. You may be cold sitting there waiting for the tub to fill up. And again, when it's time to get out, you have to drain all of the water first before you can open the door to get out. So some things to consider. In the shower itself, you have an opportunity. If you have a walk-in shower, you can use a shower chair, which is pictured on the far left. Again, a very safe option. Or you can have a, a bench that folds up and down. These you see a lot in spas. So again, very aesthetically pleasing. Um, or we have a prefab unit as well on the far right. I just caution you with this a little bit because a lot of the prefab units are quite low where the, uh, where the chair is, or the, uh, the bench portion is, and it's also sloped slightly forward. That allows water to run off. But again, if it's low and it's sloped forward, it's gonna be a very difficult potentially to, uh, to get off of that, and you don't wanna necessarily be stuck in the shower. Different things that you can also use is uh, to again avoid bending over is a shower plug that is just a push button one. So rather than actually bending over and putting in and out the plug of the bathtub, you can use your long handled reacher and just push down on it. And with a clicking mechanism, it will lock off the bathtub. You could fill up the water, get in, have a nice bath. And after you get out and dry it off, again, just one handed with your, with your reacher or whatever to pop that open and the water will drain. We suggest you also adjust the temperature. So if you really like to take a hot shower, that's really fatiguing and it takes a lot of energy out of you. So think about if you have a big day ahead of you, maybe taking a shower the night before would be a good option so that you have the energy available for you the day of your big event, whether it's coming to a conference such as this, going to uh, one of your grandkids' plays or football games, hockey games, whatever, whatever you're doing, playing a round of golf. If you need to conserve that energy to engage in your meaningful occupations, it's better to take a shower again the night before and just to do the bare minimum in the morning. With the temperature, maybe try and cool down the temperature just a little bit because, um, again, that draws a lot of energy out of you. Or if you are gonna take a nice hot shower, maybe think about just at the very end to turn it to the cool setting, just to again, give you a little bit of extra energy and, and cool you down. There's other, other long handled uh, brushes for scrubbing your feet, getting between your toes, getting your back. Lots of devices available, um, some of which are moldable that you can move and, and twist uh, that it's just right for you. Quite, quite ingenious. Uh, transferring on and off the toilet. Again, this is another opportunity where a lot of people trip and. Uh, and fall or slip. Uh, a couple of different options we have. So we have, again, something like the super pole. So this is a pole on the far left that is a, as a swing out arm that you can use, and this can be bolted down to the floor if you like, or again, they do have options where they are floor to ceiling friction fit to provide that sturdy support for you to stand up on. We don't want you grabbing onto the soap or the toilet paper holder to be able to push up on, because again, that can potentially give way and rip off. There's a picture in the top right of one of the, I believe it was a toilet roll holder ripping right out of the wall. Um, it's better to get a grab bar rather than having one on a diagonal. The new recommendation is to have one uh, vertical and horizontal and L-shaped like you see there. Again, it gives you an additional structure to push up on, whereas the ones that are on diagonal, they're okay to grab and to pull up on, but there's not much of a surface to push down on to get yourself up off of the toilet. So consider installing an L-shaped L grab bar beside the toilet. Um, one opportunity for portability also is what's called a VersaFrame. And that's your picture on the uh, second from the right. And this is a contraption that attaches onto the toilet. So you take off your toilet seat and it just goes right over top and then you attach your toilet seat 
on top, and it provides you with a stable base to push up on. So they're the, they're the arms that go onto your existing existing toilet. Or you can have a again a removable um, arm that flips up and out of the way when not needed. If you're worried about space or if you're worried about aesthetics, uh, you can certainly use that. Talking about aesthetics. Nobody seems to like the raised toilet seats. You have company, you're embarrassed, you don't want people to see it. You take it off the toilet and you hide it in the shower and then it doesn't get put back on. I know it happens all the time, it's okay. Um, one option would be, and this is the option that I really like, is either A, getting what's called a right height toilet, so replacing your toilet altogether and making sure that it is a taller version that makes getting on and off quite easy. So again, we wanna keep our hips above our knees. Um, or if you can't do that, or if you don't want to do that, you can get what's called a toilevator. And that's what's on the bottom left-hand side. And rather than having a raised toilet seat sit on top of the toilet, um, this actually goes underneath the toilet and it raises the whole toilet up. Okay, so it's nice, it's hygienic, it's clean. Um, most people don't even know it's there. And again, that's on that bottom left, that bottom base. Uh, and you, again, they can come, on, come in different sizes, two or three inches, to lift up that toilet to the right height for you. Um, there are a couple of different types of raised toilet seats that you may be aware of. Some of them, for ease of portability, taking on and off, um, just simply fit on top of the toilet seat, and that's the one that's in the middle. And there's no clamps, there's nothing really holding it on. So again, a little bit more dangerous that if you are trying to get off and something slips, that bowl can sometimes kick off to the side and fall and cause you to fall. Um, so what they've done is created a clamping mechanism. So again, it can go on the toilet and that's on the far right, and you clamp it down by twisting the knob, and it attaches right onto the toilet. This particular model has arms, which again provides you extra stability to push up on. I just have some concern with that, that if it's not tightened all the way, um, again, you push up on one side with a little bit more force than the other, it could potentially tip and could cause you to fall. And again, depending on which way you're leaning, you could go down quite hard into the counter, which is sometimes located right beside the toilet. Um, so again, you have to choose what's right for you, what's right for your space and what your comfort level is, and also what works for your own personality. Um, again, if you're, having, if you're having bath mats in and around the toilet, uh, just be very careful with them. We recommend not having them, but if you're going to have them, uh, make sure that they are sort of taped down. I like using them for bathtubs in that when you get out, it's a nice uh, dry place to stand on to soak up the water so it's not slippery. What I would recommend is that you don't keep them there all the time, that you only put them down just when you're about to take a bath or a shower, and that when you're done, you pick them up and you lay them over top of the, the bathtub or put them away so that they don't pose a tripping hazard. All of these resources are available um, online for you to access. Um, and these are different checklists that you can use so that if you want to do a sort of tour of your own home and think about all the different rooms and, and think about what I've talked about today on how you can make adaptations, these are two good lists. One is Maintaining Seniors Independence, a guide to home adaptations. And again, these are freely available online. Um, you can just Google their names and, the, and they'll pop up. And the second one is a Safe Living Guide, uh, a guide to home safety for seniors. And these are checklists that provide um, with a more thorough breakdown, sort of room by room on different things and different strategies to look for. I would recommend, if you're interested in this, to contact the College of Occupational Therapists of Ontario, that's CODO, um, and you can find an occupational therapist if you're interested in having somebody come out to do a home assessment on your own home with you. You can find an occupational therapist by visiting this website, um, www.coto.org and they have an option to find an occupational therapist and you can set up a visit and they will actually do a whole home assessment with you um, to point out all the potential dangers and provide you with uh, opportunities and strategies for moving forward to make sure that you maintain your independence. Going outside of the home, we want to maintain your mobility within the community as well, so we want you to be engaged. Uh, in doing all the things that you want to be doing. Uh, and one of the things it would be using a mobility aid if it comes to the point where you're having significant uh, balance issues or you just want to feel a little bit more confident in your balancing abilities, we would recommend you use either a cane or a walker. Uh, we want to make sure that they are set up properly for you. Okay, so rather than just going to the store and buying one, maybe consider working with a healthcare provider to make sure that it is set up properly for you. A rough rule of thumb is that for a cane or a walker, you want to make sure that the handles uh, come up to the crease of your wrist when they're hanging at your side. Okay, so we don't want you too high up on your walker, and we don't want you bending over too far low using the walker, and that typically results in around a 15 degree bend in, in your elbow. 
when using the cane, especially now that we're getting into the winter months, and I was happy to see one over at one of the vendors, was a, was a cleat that you can attach onto your cane. And again, it's a metal cleat that flips up so that when you're, not, uh, when you're not walking outside, you're not damaging the floors. But when you go outside and there's ice and snow involved, you can flip it down. And it's uh, very sharp pointed edges that provide a lot, of, a lot of traction. You also want to make sure that you replace your rubber stopper on the end of your cane regularly to make sure that you do have that good, uh, good grip. Um, when using the walker, you want to make sure that you don't place it too far forward in front of you. You want to make sure that you're walking with it within the base of support of the walker. Okay? If it's too far in front of you and you trip, you're not going to be able to use it to help stop yourself from falling. You're just going to go flat, uh, flat unfortunately, on your, on your face and fall forward. Um, always need to remember to use the brakes. So when you're, when you're using the walker, make sure that you're not pulling up on the walker as well. Okay? So when you're using it, if you're going to stand up, make sure the brakes are on. You push up from where you are. You grab onto the walker, make sure you're nice and steady, then you would release the brakes, and then you would go. Same with getting into a chair. You would back up, as I mentioned before, put the brakes on, don't just flop down holding onto the walker. Reach behind you, know where you're going to sit, slowly lower yourself down, and then let go of the walker. And take it with you. Again, I see it all, all too often. People leave the walker in the corner and then navigate to a spot. And again, sometimes that certainly is, is a requirement. Um, but if, if you can, try and take it with you at all, at all times. Something, a neat product that they do have available if you are prone to falling is what are called comfy hips. And this is an undergarment that has padding in it that protects your hips so that if you are a frequent faller and you're afraid of fracturing a hip, you can use, um, you can use these. They're quite, um, you don't see them on you. So you can wear them freely. Nobody knows that you're wearing them. Um, it's just like a pair of regular undergarments with some, uh, some padding in there. Um, which is a great, uh, great opportunity. They've done a couple of research studies and shown that the forces uh, have been distributed over through the padding versus your bones, which could then break. A couple of different opportunities that you can also use for mobility is using external cueing devices. So I've done a couple of research studies at, uh, at the university looking at this particular device, and this is called a mobilizer. So again, if you're having issues with gait, if you have a short shuffling gait, are walking and you tend to freeze, you might consider using something like an external cue. In this particular case, it's a laser beam and this unit clips on to either your cane or your walker and it provides a red line, a red laser beam on the ground and then you are asked to sort of walk towards or step over the line. And you can see on the bottom, this is on an electronic mat that we pick up real-time footsteps. And on the far left, we have somebody using the, uh, their walker without a, a laser cue. And as they go to turn, that's when they, they turn what's called on block, take really short shuffling steps around the turn versus with the cue, you can see it's much more fluid. Their steps, the step length is actually further apart and it's much smoother. What we found is that for some people, this worked really well and it worked really well for improving step length, but for other people, it didn't work. So this is one of those things that you're gonna have to sort of try and see what works for you. For other people, it might be an external auditory cue. And I've done work again with Jessica Gron at, uh, at Western University. I have two PhD students working on projects right now looking at using external cue or looking at music to help improve gait. And what we're recommending right now is if you listen to music that is high in familiarity, so you know the music quite well, and it has a high groove, so it, it makes you want to move. It makes you want to, you know, you tap your feet and stomp your hands and, and what have you. That's the music that we want you to listen to. And it helps with the internal timing of things, which is disrupted with, uh, with Parkinson's at times. And this tends to help improve velocity, cadence, helps with freezing of gait, and also helps with your turn time. Okay, so again, simple strategies that you can use by having either a Walkman or an, an iPod or whatever wireless device you want to use uh, and get a chance to listen to, uh, to music, especially exercise. We know exercise is a great, uh, a great strategy for, uh, for life in general, not just for individuals with Parkinson's disease. So if you're going for out for walks in the community and that, think about maybe uh, putting on a headset if you are having issues with short, uh, short sort of shuffling steps. We also have what's called a cognitive cueing approach. And this is something that involves no equipment, it just involves yourself thinking about taking big steps. And I worked with uh, Dr. Mary Jenkins on a project where we literally asked people in the lab, we had them go up and down the, uh, our, again, our magic car carpet, we call it, the gate right, and picks up real time what they're doing. And we asked them just to walk normally, and they would walk. And then we asked them to walk and think about taking big steps. Well, you know, they took bigger steps. 
They walked faster. Um, and it was just a simple cognitive cue of them directing their attention to what they were doing. So when we walk, for most of us, we just walk. We don't, we don't attend to walking. We don't use a lot of cognition to walk. And in Parkinson's disease, the basal ganglia, which is partially controlled for, for walking, that's the area that's damaged. So by thinking about these strategies, by thinking about taking big steps, by thinking about sort of keeping your head up, by thinking about bending at the knee, you're changing that automatic task of walking to a conscious task, and you're essentially rewiring the brain or using a different circuitry system to walk. And we're able to, to see that it actually makes big improvements. Now, in this particular case, it was uh, linked with a video-based assignment um, where we had people in the lab, we saw immediate improvements, but then we also videotaped them and had them go home and watch themselves walking and had them practice walking with these video cues. And it worked incredibly well. And people, I think even six months after the fact, came back to Dr. Um, Dr. Jenkins and said, it is still working, I can't believe it. Yes? Is persistence? Pardon me? Is there persistence as well? Does it work when you're not doing No, no, so you do, you do have to be thinking about it um, in order for it to work for what, we knew, for what we know right now. Again, it's because it's, we're sort of tricking the brain circuitry, so to speak, um, that if it reverts back to that automatic nature, you're using the same system that was um, having issues in the first place. Um, but if, if this would work well, for example, if you think about you're having a freezing episode um, and you're trying to get through that doorway or something, if you think about taking big steps, uh, it may help you break that freezing episode. Or if you're in a rushed situation, if you're trying to cross the street, um, again, sort of do that self-talk to yourself. and It will get you across the street with uh, greater step length and velocity. And we have polls, urban polling. We also have in the back corner, I was speaking with a the gentleman. Um, these things are, are the, new, the new thing, and they, they do help with balance. They help you with a stable gait. They help you with your core. Uh, they also help with uh, step length and also your velocity increase as well. So something to, uh, to consider using. Again, there's a couple of uh, vendors here that I see are carrying the, the urban poles, uh, something quite nice to use. And finally, looking at um, community mobility in terms of car mobility, um, I only have a slide or two on this, and I don't want to spoil it, but I know we mentioned about the um, mobility issue, or about the webinars that are going to be taking place. Um, Dr. Lillian Alvarez will be, I believe, hosting one of these on driving in Parkinson's disease next year. Um, so she's certainly the expert in this. Uh, but a couple of things that you can use for getting in and out of your car to make it a little bit safer would be what's called a handy bar. And this is on the top right hand uh, side there. And again, it's just a handle that links into your, your car and provides a stable position to push up on. We have a seat belt grabber. Again, if you're having range of motion difficulties and putting on your seat belt, it's a link that can attach onto the seat belt and allow you to put it on that much easier. We also have a swivel seat or a, a twist assist swivel cushion, it's called. And again, that allows you to sit down and get into that car that much easier if you're having mobility issues. And in terms of driving, I recently had a new vehicle a couple of years ago and had the opportunity to have some new high-tech features is what I call them anyways. I absolutely love them and I won't buy another vehicle without them. It would be a backup camera, a lane assist, and also a system that allows me, or that tells me when I need to brake. Okay, so if I'm maybe a little bit distracted or just going a little bit too fast, um, it all of a sudden sends a auditory signal, beep, 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 and also a visual signal telling me to brake if I'm approaching a vehicle. So again, may help with if you have slower reaction times. Um, research does suggest that individuals with Parkinson's are more prone to making driving errors and fail on the road tests more frequently than individuals without. Um, Parkinson's. We're not suggesting you stop driving. That's not what I'm doing at all. What I'm suggesting you do is you think about your abilities and think about using adaptive technology to help you maintain your driving for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. Um, again, the back, backup camera and the lane assist, the backup camera lets you see where you're going, so it helps with those visual deficits when you're backing up and the spatial discrepancies. And the lane assist allows you to see when somebody's in your blind spot. So again, if you're having mobility or um, range of motion issues with checking your blind spot, that's quite, uh, quite useful. A couple of other things. We have the uh, lane maintenance standards, and these are highlighted in red. And these are more like antennas that go on the front of your vehicle, and it helps you maintain your... Um, your lane trajectory. So if you find that you're wandering out of your lanes or if you're having trouble wandering out of your lanes, this has proven uh, 
to work quite well for individuals. Again, it's on an individual basis. Some people it works well for, some people it doesn't. Um, but that's from a driving rehabilitation specialist that I've worked with. We also have panoramic rear view mirrors that again, allow greater uh, flexibility for seeing in your blind spots and seeing what's available um, around your vehicle. And then we have the smart view mirror, which again, helps with blind spots. And I think at that point, I will, I will stop and uh, take questions at this time. I will mention that we do have a photo exhibit. I don't know if you've noticed on your left. When you walked in this morning, we have a number of photos that are on display. That was from a research project that I was involved with and led with uh, Dr. Andrew Johnson, Debbie Rudman, and Mary Jenkins, looking at what it's like to live with Parkinson's disease. And we asked photos to take, or individuals with Parkinson's to take photos of what it was like to live. And they came in for interviews. And some of the material that we got was just absolutely fascinating. The material that I'm presenting today out there is just from our first couple of participants. We've had 19 individuals participate in this project. And we are also going to be having one coming up on, on driving. Um, on, on a topic which was quite interesting in that most everybody that participated in the project, they identified driving as uh, something that they were quite interested in and it was a meaningful occupation for them and they wanted assistance with maintaining the ability to drive for as long as possible. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm willing to take uh, questions for a couple of minutes if we have time. Yes.